So I know what you're thinking. Why is this episode so incredibly delayed? I mean, obviously it isn't, because from your perspective, this episode's coming out on time. I actually was supposed to start recording this several, several, several minutes ago, and kind of failed at that, because I decided to tinker with something first. And so I just thought I'd show you off, you know, what I came up with. You can feel free to give me feedback or not. I've kind of decided not to use it, but this is something I kind of threw together. Uh, it actually took longer than it thought than you'd think. Believe it or not, it's actually bits and pieces of several uh, different consoles, uh, specifically uh, from Voyager, actually, that were thrown together. I don't really like the look of it, though. It doesn't look quite like how I was actually envisioning when I first, you know thought it up in my head. So I've decided rather than go ahead and use this, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of it. So, uh, there we go. <clears throat> Getting back on topic. I gotta warn you guys, I know the last two episodes have been kind of short. I've decided to stop being ashamed of that fact. There's nothing wrong with having a 20 minute episode, I think. Especially if that, that whole 20 minutes is me talking non-stop. Uh, Lord knows I can do that for longer in some episodes. Nevertheless, I just got to say that I don't have much to say about this episode. It's very by the books. It's very by the numbers. If I were actually doing a gradient scale of like 1 to 10, this would be a 5. It's competently done. It fails to excel. There are several scenes which I, I could literally feel could have been done better if they had actually had a little bit more precise directing, if the writing had been a little more, more pinpoint, if the pacing had been... Like, each scene feels like it spills over a little bit too much into the next scene. And then there's some really good performances from McNeil and from Dawson. So it's not like it's a bad episode. It's just they kind of... Well, the pro my biggest problem with this episode is the premise. We've done this before, haven't we? On Voyager, with Tom, we've done this before, right? We've done this exact same plotline. Tom gets seduced by some alien, oh, you just want to be free thing. And then he's saved from it. That's the plot. I just spoiled it for you. Sorry, guys. I hate I hate to spoil things. It's it's you know it's it's part of my mandate to spoil everything all over the time, all the time. Um, and there's a lot of weird little things. Like I know this is a weird thing to be bothered by, but they came within two hundred thousand clicks of a junkyard before they detected it. I don't know if you how much you guys know about space or anything like that, but two hundred thousand clicks is not that long of a distance when it comes to interstellar phenomena, and that's the first time they detected it. Now that is still feasible; it's entirely possible he actually has some kind of you know. Oh God, I need to stay cloaked just in case. Oh, I don't know. Say the um, uh, the hierarchy from just last episode show up, since this is the hierarchy's territory, right? I mean, we wouldn't make an episode while well, completely forgetting the events of the previous episode, right? That's that's forbidden. We'd never do that. Um, so I went to try and, as usual, look some behind-the-scenes stuff for this episode, and I found nothing. Like, nothing. The only thing I found was a reference to Christine, the Stephen King novel. That's it. The actress who played Alice does a pretty good job of her since she plays her as if she's not human, and I like her presentation. She literally plays her as if she's a ship. Like a combination of seductive and violent. Which is a weird combo, but she does it quite well. It's funny because I kept looking at her face like, she looks really familiar. And it turns out she's actually in Stargate Atlantis, the first season anyways, as a uh, semi-recurring character. I also have to say the entire concept of a junkyard, my first thought was, cool, Delta Quadrant, random junk that they need, awesome. Where was this in season one? You know, when this kind of thing would have been like, oh, yes, thank God, a junkyard. I, I'm still going to give them points for it. Uh, John Fleck, by the way, is the actor who plays the traitor. Uh, Abaddon is his name. <laughs> Wonderful name choice, by the way. Um, I only point him out because he plays several recurring roles, uh, well, several roles throughout the rest of Star Trek, but most notably uh, one of the main uh, characters, well, one of the main NPCs, if you will, over on Enterprise. I think he does great job here. He plays the traitor just as well as he plays the, oh god, please don't kill me, just as well as he plays the, oh, thank god she's gone. Like, he, he comes, he, he manages several different layers of his own character throughout this episode. He does a good job of it, so definite props to him. Uh, we've seen him already over in Deep Space Nine. We'll see him again, like I said, in Enterprise. So, yeah, I have a note here. <clears throat> Tom slowly getting obsessed over something. Haven't we done this song and dance before? 
I think the only thing they could have done if they were really stuck to that premise to, to make this work is to have it be an untwist situation. In other words, there is no big sinister plan. There's no big horrible, you know, oh god, I am evil and I'm going to kill you and take you away from your friends and make you hurt your and try to kill your wife situation, you know. Try try to take that out of it. As is it is a, as I said extremely by the numbers. Not bad. Not bad. Not good. Um it's also, and then, and then there's this gigantic gap in my notes. Like, fast forward about 30 minutes, and then we get to the next thing I felt like writing a note on, which was the fact that they established right at the beginning that this ship has weapons that specifically disrupt tractor beams. And everyone, and I'm like, okay, yeah. And it's just in the back of my mind, yep. You know, first thing Janeway says is tractor beams, because of course she forgot. And I can forgive that. She's the captain, she's got other things in her mind. And yet everyone else seems to have forgotten that too. In fact, it's treated like this big deal that they that they get away, and they never actually even mention the disrupting tractor beam, even though that was an advertised part of the ship. Neurogenic interface, disrupting tractor beam, metaphasic shields. Those are the three selling points. Uh, one thing I do like, and I really do genuinely like this, they come across this beryllium crystal, which is apparently a court in one of the local areas worth a huge amount of money. It's incredibly valuable, but only to a specific group of people. Okay, that makes sense. I like that. And they, obviously they have plans for that. That kind of wealth would be extremely useful to Voyager. They, don't, they aren't actually interested in wealth itself. This is not an interest in lavishness or luxury or whatever. That is supplies to Voyager. And yet they traded away without hesitation to get their crew member back. Something about that made me smile. I mentioned this back in the episode The Raven, I believe it was, where Voyager, without hesitation, without question, violated a sovereign territory and basically made an enemy of an entire people to save one of their crew who had just recently betrayed them, which Tom also did, by the way. It is, again, one of the things Voyager actually does very right over the course of this series. That, that f family sense, the sense that these people actually care about each other, that, that um, chemistry that naturally exudes between the actors. It really came across in this episode. And I actually felt like they gave a damn about Tom. You know, Tom's a whole, oh, I'm slowly turning evil thing was fairly stereotypical. But, what, you know, there's this wonderful, wonderful coda where McNeil absolutely nails it. He's sitting there, and you can just tell in his face he's devastated. He's acting like he was possessed. Like, I could see what I was doing, and it was like I was in a daydream, and it was terrifying. And... I don't even understand, you know, how I how I dealt with this or all those terrible things I did. And he's just there's there's not even like the ah, he's not even freaking out. He's just empty. And I like that. It's a really good presentation of that. Um and so that's kind of it. That's most of what I have to talk about except for one little additional thing. So Alice refers to the particle fountain as home. And she's never no one else has ever been able to get her closer. And it requires a skilled pilot and her shields and you know whole setup to get in there. She needs a pilot to get in there. And she is able to reach across light years in order to be able to affect and influence someone else and basically try to kill someone else who she had previously rewritten their neurons. These are the only facts we have when it comes to Alice. And that really got me thinking. I was a bit disappointed that STO did not continue the story of Alice, did not actually pursue this uh, arc. I, I think it's one of those things that's, that's ripe for continuation. In the absence of anything, we are left to pure speculation. Because this is left dangling. They never actually answer who or what Alice is, why she was going to the particle, fo particle fountain, how she has the power she has. So let's go ahead and give the obvious answer. <clears throat> Writing. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way... Let's speculate a little bit, because I do actually have a theory. A Voyager theory! And I'd like to share it with you. My first thinking was actually leaning a little bit more towards the Borg. Like this was a Borg that at one point in time got completely, utterly segregated from the Collective. I'm, I'm talking in the range of like decades previous to now. And has slowly been re... Re reconstructing uh, themselves bit by bit into this new creature, into this new ship, which still requires a biological component. And while I thought that idea was at least somewhat interesting, the more I look at it, the more I think I as a writer would take it a different direction. 
imagine, if you will, there's an alien species out there. And this alien species has discovered, oh, I don't know, a particle fountain. And within this particle fountain is this amazing life form, which, which is partially dimensionally shifted from ours. And imagine that these people have looked at this life form and said, that right there is beautiful and wonderful, amazing. I wonder what would happen if we were to capture it and try to harness it. And so they craft this, they, 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 they go through all the expense and time and effort of capturing one of those beings, ripping it out of the particle fountain and binding it to a ship. And as a safety mechanism, the ship itself has to have a pilot. You know, you, there needs to be a biological component. The ship can't run itself. And that's how they keep track of it. But of course, they overreach their bounds because they de develop this neurogenic interface, which enables them to directly control the ship. There's an old saying, when you have a contest of wills with someone, make sure your will's the stronger. So what if one of these engineers who's building this prison ship that's designed to be basically powered by, not powered by, that's really the wrong word. Like, like imagine if the only reason this ship functions the way it does, I don't mean literally the power source, I mean, well, effectively what I mean is that this, I am describing a magitech. In other words, a form of technology that utilizes magic. Now, of course, there's no magic in Star Trek, but this is the Star Trek equivalent. I mean, we have magitech in Star Wars as well, for example, with force attack. So this is basically ener energy attack or whatever. This thing, this technology specifically moves and functions because there's this being moving through it and, and powering it. And this being wants really badly to go back home. And so it uses the neurogenic interface to take someone and starts to get a little bit better, and this probably took years and years of it slowly trying to take people bit by bit. I'm sure the people, once they found it out, they just got rid of the damn thing. Or it fled, but the person who was in it was either able to commit suicide or was, wasn't able to actually finish the journey. You know, something. And so it's been drifting from owner to owner, who bit by bit have been trying to inch it either back to home or trying to get it away from home as people resist it. And Tom was the one who, as she says, gets it closest. That's about all I've got for that. Ultimately, the other idea I had is very mundane. The other idea I had was basically that this is a rogue AI. That this is an AI which has come to believe that its purpose in existence is to ascend to a higher energy state. And the best way to do that is to use a specific combination of energy that would be put upon it that would basically disintegrate it into this new energy being. And it's wrong and it's insane. <laughs> It, doesn't, it would just be destroyed, but it doesn't know that, and so it desperately wants to get to this energy conduit that it detected, and has been leading its pilots in, you know, inch by inch closer to this damn particle fountain, bit by bit, until finally it tries to drag Tom in and fails. Or maybe it's an ex-Borg thing, or maybe the writers just didn't have any ideas. I mean, I have nothing to go on here. I would love to hear your guys' theories, especially since, as you can see, I'm, I'm already out of time. Like, I'm already out of stuff to talk about. I, 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 the notes are gone. There. I've, I've got nothing else. I'm sorry, guys. Next week, I actually looked ahead this time, next week is Riddles, which hopefully I'll actually have a little bit more to talk about. Either way, uh, I will be seeing you guys next week. Alice. And let me know what you think about that, that overlay thing. I, I have a few other ideas, but I haven't really had time to tinker with it. So, anyway.